All right, Karen, you're on, you're on. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie, and thank you to the York Library for hosting this program. My name is Karen Massey, and I am a member of the Camden Conference Southern Maine Community Events Committee. Um, and we've been hosting these commit events in Southern Maine for the last about seven years. Um, before that, there were events in Midcoast Maine. Um, and uh, this year's Camden Conference is February 20th and 21st. It's a little shorter than, than the live conferences, but it promises to be an excellent con conference, the 34th annual conference, and it's titled The Geopolitics of the Arctic, A Region in Peril. Um, the tickets are on sale now on the website, and um, you'll be able to, if you get a ticket, live stream the conference and ask questions in real time. Um, and there's a terrific roster of speakers. The keynote will be Olafur Grimson, the former president of Iceland, um, and David Brancaccio will be the moderator. Um, and originally they were gonna be coming from the Camden Co Opera House, but I think he's actually gonna be at home. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I, I think it'll be a terrific conference and I hope some of you will join us. Um, and now I want to introduce our speaker for tonight, who is Jeff Thaler. He's a professor of practice at the Maine Law School and an associate university um, counsel for the floating offshore wind projects at the University of Maine. He's also an associate faculty member of the University of Maine's Climate Change Institute. He currently teaches administrative law the Environmental and Administrative Law Practicum and Energy Law at the University of Maine School of Law. And in 2020, he created a new course, Environmental and Climate Litigation, which compares the trends in the US, China, and Europe. Um, he's also co-founder of the Arctic Futures Institute, a collaboration of the University of Maine and Maine Law School, and co-founder of the Environmental and Energy Technology Council, known as E2Tech, and uh, the American College of Environmental Lawyers. And uh, with that introduction, I will turn it over to Jeff. Great, thank you very much, Karen. Thank you very much, Sophie. And thank you everybody who is Zooming in tonight for our discussion. And I, I really appreciate your interest and will try to move things along in terms of the slides. The slides will be made available. I will share them with Sophie afterwards so that you'll have access to them and you can use them to quiz your friends and neighbors uh, over meals or other Zoom calls. And I have provided some links in some of the slides so that again, if you wanna dig deeper, you can definitely do that. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and um, so again this is just w the reason that I, I want to compare the impacts of climate change on Maine and Greenland you might ask the question why aren't they so different aren't they pretty far apart and how is there any commonality or uh, synchronicity between the two and uh, we do have a ringer in the house tonight. One of the attendees is Vinton Valentine, who went to Greenland with me and some others uh, from Maine and University of Maine and USM. But what's interesting, I knew very, very little, totally very little about Greenland before we did this trip in the summer of 2019. So who am I? Again, Karen has introduced me and basically can skip over the first paragraph. Um, I have been teaching. I've also am still practicing law, have had a variety of different jobs and have been working on the floating offshore wind projects for the University of Maine and, and really the only one in the country and in the Americas. So that's also been part of my interest in terms of climate issues as well as, as clean energy. So this is a slide and this is a quote that I use frequently in all my classes. And it was something I came across years ago. Those of you familiar with Yogi Berra from years ago know that he used to have a reputation of having a lot of malapropisms, you know, sayings that made no sense until you scratched your head, gave it some thought and realized, well, maybe there's something there. And that ultimately I found this helpful in the practice of law as well as teaching and it really is helpful in terms of policy making and otherwise, because 
if you don't know what your goal is, if you don't know where trends are heading, um, you may not be able to plan appropriately and know essentially, again, when you get there, you'll be lost is just that suddenly you haven't done what you needed to do to be able to address issues that are coming down the pike. And that really is a situation with respect to climate change. And this is a slide just in the Washington Post on the 12th. And it shows pretty dramatically the lower part of the graph are thousands of years before the present. And to the left are parts per million change. So not parts per million in the atmosphere, which is over 400 parts per million now. If any of you are familiar with the 350.org group that um, was started some years ago, we're well past 350 in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere. But this is again, change over a thousand years. And so you can see over the last thousand years, just this straight line here. And if you looked at it even over 500 years or 400 or 300, really since the industrial revolution is where CO2 in the atmosphere has taken off. So let's do a little comparison. Um, I, I was thinking about this earlier this week, so I added this slide. And, and what's striking to me is that uh, again, I think all of you already know, climate change is primarily caused by our burning of fossil fuels, among other things, but primarily the burning of fossil fuels and the emission of greenhouse gases. And again, primarily carbon dioxide and methane. And yet, even though we have all these changes happening and know that it's a bad trend, and we'll talk about the impacts and the rest of the talk, Greenland is still very dependent on fossil fuels for its use. And you can see 28% renewables and slash nuclear was in the uh, statistic, but they don't have a nuclear power plant, um, but largely still on fossil fuels. The United States even more dependent on fossil fuels and the uh, you know Maine itself is a little less dependent on fossil fuels, more on renewables, but still a minority on renewables. And that's because of our hydro, hydroelectric facilities. And, um, but we are still the most dependent on oil for heating of any state in the country. And we also use a lot of oil petroleum for our transportation, for driving more per capita than almost any state in the country because Mainers drive more per capita than than most because we're commuting for work. So where in the world is this? I know Vinton will recognize it. Um, this is where we were staying. This is the town of Narsasuk, and I'll show you a map in a minute as to where it is in Greenland. But the reason I wanted to show this to you, it's a little hard to see in this map, but this, the reason this is here, the reason the town is here is that during World War II, the US built several air force bases in greenland and in part that again was in, in with respect to and a concern of germany moving across the atlantic and and using greenland as a base but there's a long air, air airplane runway here up in this area of the where my cursor is near the water here and so these are where planes fly in and land to get to Greenland. What I did not realize, and a lot of people don't realize, you cannot fly directly from Boston, say, to Greenland. What you have to do is you have to fly over Greenland from Boston to Iceland, to Reykjavik, leave the international airport, go downtown to, in Reykjavik to the domestic airport, and then take a, quote, domestic flight from Iceland over to Greenland, going backwards, going west again. So you have to overshoot Greenland to then get back to it. Um, just a couple quick pictures. This is one I took there of a, a glacier, but the reason I'm showing it, you can see some of the little icebergs here. You see a lot of icebergs in Greenland in the fjords and in the water. And because the glaciers are, are calving and, and breaking up and you can see all the rock here that was probably covered by ice not that long ago. Um, now, this is a picture I want you to remember because I'll come back to it a little later in the presentation. Beautiful scene, beautiful mountain here. You get a sense of the type of cities, villages that they have, the type of architecture they have. Great setting, but there's a, a proposal that would 
potentially dramatically change that scene that um, again, and that puts Greenland right in the, in the, I'll call it the crosshairs of geopolitical and, and national security issues worldwide, not just in the North Atlantic. And these are two sort of pictures of Greenland to the left is more of a, uh, from up in space, you can see over to the left, uh, parts of Canada and Northern, Northeastern Canada, heading down to the Maritimes and then uh, New England. And up here, this big island, this is the largest uh, island after Australia in the world, but it is largely ice, as you can see. This is to the right, more of a topographical map, but what I wanted to show here is basically where the towns or cities are over here on the west and particularly the southwest coast, just a couple on the east. The rest of it is largely uninhabited. And you can see how close Canada is here. But where we were, it was really down toward the southern tip, southwestern tip of Greenland, primarily. And you can see Iceland over to the east, to the right there. So a few more comparisons with Greenland and Maine, and then I'll actually dig into Greenland before we compare it uh, with more facts and, and information about Maine. Greenland is huge. And uh, it is way bigger than Maine, and it has way fewer people. So it has many fewer people per square mile, certainly because it's largely covered with ice. You can see it's, it's about 80% covered by ice. But I wanted to show you in comparison that you would have to add Alaska and Texas together and, and still just barely be underneath the size of Greenland. Um, and while we think of Alaska having a lot of ice cover in Alaska, it, it really does not, particularly compared with Greenland. And this is relevant because ice melts as, as we have climate change and we have global warming. Uh, and I show you just the coastline statistic. Greenland has a long coastline, fourth longest in the world compared to three other countries. Maine is pretty small, although in the United States, when you go up and down the inlets and peninsulas of Maine, about 3,500 miles is fairly significant, still not the largest or longest or most amount of miles, but we too have concerns about sea level rise because of our coast. Very few people in Greenland. So again, something I had not known, only 56,000 people. Nook is the capital, is the largest city. Uh, so you can see it's about a third of the population, entire population of Greenland. And I was curious, Portland itself is 66,500, but the, the actual census metropolitan area, you can see how large that is, not quite uh, half or a third. It's between a half, you know, a, actually it's a little less than a third of what Maine is, but it's still significant. Actually, maybe more than a third. Sorry, my math is off there. But anyway, 56,000 people in all of Greenland, which is smaller than Portland. Um, so what is Greenland? I always have to catch myself. Greenland is not a country. It is not a nation. It is part of Denmark, has limited self-government. They are Danish citizens. Most of the revenue for their economy comes from Denmark, but they do have the right to elect their own parliament and government with some sovereignty, but not complete sovereignty from a law that was passed in 2009. They could, by referendum, become an independent state. They have not yet chosen to do so, but that's always a possibility. So they do have self-government as to these topics here, health, education, fisheries, environment, and climate, but they don't. Denmark governs things, you know, criminal procedure, defense, national security, the monetary system, and foreign affairs. And partly the reason that's relevant is that Denmark does not want to give up Greenland at the moment because it's Greenland that is, is partly above the Arctic Circle and therefore it allows Denmark to be at the table with countries like the United States, uh, Canada, Russia, Norway, China is, it, you know, it also puts itself at the table as the Arctic nations, the Arctic Circle nations, and, and Denmark wants a piece of it. And I'll show you why again in a couple minutes. 
So what do Greenlanders think about climate change? They've been surveyed in the last two years and most of them say they've experienced the effects of climate change. Only half think it's detrimental uh, and 9% think it will improve it. And you might say, well, how can climate change improve living conditions? Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. The statistics here, again, think about that 80% of experience climate change firsthand in terms of how many might that be in the US. They do wanna invest in clean energy, et cetera. But here's a comparison between Greenland and the US. And this was a survey taken 2018, 2019, they had a significant heat wave. So again, most Greenlanders say they've personally experienced it. Americans, much smaller. And what's interesting is that statistically now, a majority of Americans polled will say that they believe there is climate change, they believe it is human caused, but only a minority will say they actually think they've experienced it. And that's important because that is what raises the issue about motivating people to support policies or initiatives or the expenditures of money to address it. So there's a, a disconnect there. Um, what are they worried about in Greenland? You know, it's the unpredictable weather, the loss and thinning of sea ice, which I'll show an interesting slide next to how that, what that impact actually is. Permafrost melting is a concern really globally, not just in Greenland. And again, one of the reasons I wanna to talk to you about Greenland tonight is that Greenland is like what I would consider even more so than the Amazon in, in Brazil or the rainforest in Indonesia, because what happens there, say in the deforestation of the rainforest where there's burning of trees and then you get carbon released into the atmosphere and fewer trees to absorb CO2, what happens in Greenland definitely does not stay in Greenland when it comes to global effects from climate change and global warming. Um, and again, what's interesting of this slide, and again, there's a lot here you'll have a chance to look at, but the number one concern of Greenlanders about climate change is the effect on sled dogs, this 67% this here. None of the rest, this one, people in Greenland being impacted barely gets to 50. And then you see a couple at 48 in terms of future generations, impact on people elsewhere, plant and animal species, but it's sled dogs those Greenlanders really care about. And that's partly because the sled dogs can't go out on the ice like they used to. Mm. Um, when, when Vinton and I were in Greenland, it was a week after this. So we were there right around the summer solstice. I think we may have arrived June 21st. You can see the deep red is how it's way hotter than normal. And overall it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than normal for that week. And they were actually having wildfires in Greenland, which again, when you think that it's 80 plus percent ice is, is pretty shocking. Um, so let's talk now some specifics. And I know there's a lot of text on here, so I'll just try to highlight some things, which is why I use the yellow font in places. Again, about 80% of Greenland has an ice sheet and it goes up to two miles in depth. That's what some of the glaciologists at the University of Maine who we were with, they spend their summers in Greenland drilling into the ice to get historical information about what were things like uh, millennia ago. And this was from one of the NASA scientists in this study who said that one of the effects of what's going on there is that you have a greater amount of ice melting, which means you have more fresh water flowing into the saltwater ocean, which not only changes sea level, but as you see here, reshapes the coastline, alters the coastal ecology, and has a ripple effect potentially over to the United States and, and to us. So how much are they losing ice? They're 500 plus billion tons just in 2019 and that's accelerating. And you can see 3 million tons of water a day. And again, this is fresh water largely. And when I said what happens in Greenland doesn't stay there, Greenland is the number one source of global sea level rise, 40% of the total. So if you think about the Arctic and the Antarctic, people think those are so big that they must be a big contributor 
to sea level rise that we are talking about in Maine, that others are talking about in elsewhere, in Bangladesh and Australia, worldwide, but it's largely significantly Greenland. And as you can see, you know, ultimate worst case, if all that ice sheet melted, you'd be talking a 23 foot global ocean rise, which would be just devastating. So it would, and this was a question that um, got submitted to the Camden Conference today and passed on to me, would it affect the North Atlantic circulation? You know, the, the Gulf current coming up, the Labrador current coming up, the East Coast heading toward England, the UK and elsewhere, Iceland, warming Europe more than it would normally be at their latitude? And the answer is yes, the freshwater models show can actually disrupt the circulation flow and that could make Europe colder than it has been. Um, but what's interesting is I've talked about sea level rise in the US, et cetera. We'll talk about that in Maine. Greenland is not sinking. It, it actually has less risk of sea level rise because the land itself is rising. And you can see on this slide, I had not realized that at all uh, until going there and then doing research. But it's because it makes sense. The ice sheet is so heavy that it's been pushing the land down for thousands of years. And as the ice melts, the land actually slowly rebounds. And that there's this isotonic uh, or isostatic rebound. And then there's also this ocean attraction to the ice sheet. The ice pulls the water toward it. And as the ice shrinks, the ocean falls away and the sea level lowers. So ironically, when again, I said there's some people in Greenland who think climate change is not so bad. Their coastline starts to rise and as the ice melts, maybe there's some more land that they can actually access on the island. Now, um, in the old days in Maine, we were a natural resource economy, fishing, farming, forestry, uh, all three have been in decline and, and some of them particularly because of climate change, particularly fishing. And, and Greenland has some of those concerns as well, but it has pluses and minuses. So as you can see, a huge amount of their export income is from fishing. And like in Maine, as the water warms, you have different species showing up that have not been there historically in our memory or our experience. And then you have species who have been here moving northward or into continuing to colder water. So their shrimp population is declining and moving away, just like ours is. We have not had a main shrimp uh, season in what, four or five years, and they're getting mackerel, herring, uh, tuna, and others that they've never had before in the fishermen's experience. So it also allows them to catch more fish to some degree and to extend their seasons, which is a positive for, for some of them, but for some of the fishermen and industry, such as for shrimp, and, and for others, it's, it's bad. So you can see that um, they really have no way of replacing their shrimp population and that they are, they're, those part of the fishing industry there are near collapse. Um, now, we talked about sled dogs earlier and why they were the number one concern for Greenlanders. So you can see how the, the amount of ice fishing able to be done has shrunk um, two months on either end of the season. Instead of October to May, it's only December to March now, so a minority of the year. And for some, there's no ice fishing at all. And they've tried to adapt, but again, the ice is thin and, and that causes problems for the fishermen hauling out on the ice or catching things. Polar bear hunters, they have had polar bear hunters in, in Northwestern Greenland. Have, have had the same problems. And polar bears themselves have been migrating more within Greenland looking for food. And when they get to south, southern Greenland, particularly southeastern Greenland, they tend to be fairly thin, as you can see here, because they're still, now they're starting to scavenge for food. And so the hunters have to hide their meat better. And again, over the last 10 years, hard to reach the traditional hunting ground. So, um, I hadn't mentioned that Greenland largely are, are Greenlanders are made up of native 
Inuit and other uh, indigenous folk, it's definitely a minority are, are Danes or, or people Caucasian from Europe. And so for them, the disruption of their traditional hunting and fishing grounds and catches is causing a change in their culture and their economy as well. And as you can see, seal hunting has crashed. How about farming? So I had mentioned farming, forestry, and uh, fishing for Maine. The farmers have been getting drought. So just that summer that we were in, in Greenland and we had that heat wave, they were having a drought and they've had seasons of drought. And so that affects not only what they can grow, but also the animals that they can raise and then use for meat and other products. So their lambing has significantly been impacted. Their grass harvest has been reduced significantly, as you can see, and that's used to help feed the sheep during the winter, which means they have to import from somewhere else, which costs them money. So it's the disruption of the traditional precipitation patterns there. And we're seeing that in, in the US and in Maine. If you think about, um, I've been in Maine since the 80s. Um, no, yeah, take that back. Uh, moved here in the 70s, late 70s. And I can remember using a hair dryer many winter nights to try to keep my pipes from freezing in the bathroom and because it was 15 20 below on the coast and we virtually never get that anymore um and we certainly get a lot less uh you know historic snow across more months now i wanted to talk about you know i mentioned greenland being near canada sort of where it's located and i want to show you why this matters for maine and, and speaking to you all tonight, um, those of you who are from York, Portsmouth, or in that area, you've got Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, military base, submarine base uh, for building, rebuilding ships and submarines. And it, it's important because the Arctic is melting. And for some people, they view that as an opportunity because the old Northwest Passage between Russia and Alaska going over the pole, if ships can go over the pole, they save a significant amount of time and money instead of having to go around the continent. And that's what has them attracted to the possibility of more melting. And if there's more ship traffic and more uh, economic development up in this area, the ships have to stop somewhere, refuel. But one of the first ships that went through here a few years ago was a tourist ship. Uh, that docked in a tiny village, and it, um, you know, it definitely has has some impact on the local economy and culture as well. But what are the opportunities? So here in Maine, down here in the bottom, we know that down on the waterfront off Commercial Street is Imskip. Imskip is a uh, Icelandic freight company that had its one port in the United States is base in Virginia, and then moved to Portland probably eight, 10 years ago, and has increased its shipping substantially. And Maine is the closest to the North Atlantic and Europe of any US state. And so that's where Maine has seen an opportunity, an economic opportunity to establish more trade with some of these countries and more exchanges. And Greenland is therefore also sort of eyed as a potential market and a potential source potentially for certain products. And this is a map from, I took this picture off of Imskip's website, just so you can see they, their line, their red line goes from here over to Iceland. This is Greenland here where they have the black circle. But you can see how just from Portland going past Greenland to Iceland, then into Northern Europe and even over to Spain. This is where the, the Northern part of the world is getting connected. Um, and, but what's going on and the reason this is all happening is that, the, that it's the Northern hemisphere, almost as much or actually more than the Southern hemisphere, the closer you get to the polar caps, to the North Pole or the South Pole, the more impact from climate change there is as those tip closer to the sun at different times of year. And, but the Arctic is melting dramatically and, and it's 
solely from the warming climate caused by fossil fuel burning greenhouse gas emissions. But what's happening is under the Arctic sea ice are ironically undiscovered fossil fuels, a significant amount. And so what you see is the potential. And when I talk about national security issues is that countries, remember I said how countries are largely still dependent on fossil fuels. We really need to get them off fossil fuels if we're gonna slow down climate change's acceleration and impacts. And yet it's causing this loop where the Arctic Ocean is melting and then that, that results in the potential to get more fossil fuels and burn more. So this is countries that border the Arctic Circle are now in a potential race and competition to access what are these dots. And these dots are oil and gas fields or both existing and potential. And the one, the, particularly the potential ones are in, you can see in the Arctic Ocean itself but being able to get things shipped across places through the Arctic um, from one country to another, one port to another when the Arctic is melting increases. So the point is that these, this is a, an area of the world that I think over the next 10, 20 years, you're gonna see more um, potential controversy. I don't wanna say conflict, but China is definitely muscling its way. Russia as well. You can see the Sweden and Norway and, and Finland are actually in play as well. Denmark because of Greenland. Uh, Iceland barely just above the Arctic Ocean and Canada and the US. So they all know what's at stake here. Um, now I'm coming back to this. So I've talked about mining of fossil fuels and this is a village in Greenland, beautiful view. But this mountain has in it something that's not oil and not gas, but is even more valuable and more rare in the world and thus in greater demand. And thus this little village in Greenland is the target of, uh, again, a significant project that, that uh, Vinton and I had some experience with. This mountain, almost 2000 feet high, one of the largest rare earth deposits in the world. And, and you've heard about rare earth minerals. Uh, I've got some names in here of what are in this particular location. They are indispensable for our computers, our, I mean, our cars now, which are increasingly electronic, uh, anything else we try to do through the internet or et cetera, et cetera. And, but what's also important about this particular location, it's not just rare earth minerals here, uh, but it's also has uranium. And so, and again, this is how else rare earth minerals are used, but uranium is a byproduct from the mine and they're talking about doing an open pit mine. And so what the, the locals, some of them are concerned about is that wind will blow the uranium dust um, into the water, into the streams and, and harm not only the wildlife and ecosystem, but the people themselves. So we have a classic as we have experienced in Maine, those of you who lived in Maine for a while, jobs versus environment and culture debate, where most of the opposition comes from some of the local um, Inuit and other indigenous people, but a number of them are still supporting it because of the economic potential from the project. And it originally was an Australian company that was that over the last 10 years has been putting plans together is a Chinese company that has now uh, invested in the partnership. So it's a co-equal partnership. You can see 1.2 billion, it's expensive. But when I last looked this week, they are very close to getting their final permits from Greenland. And, and we've seen some of these kinds of, of debates and, and may again here in Maine. So let's move to Maine. Um, we know the slogan about Maine, the way life should be. So I say, what's, what's the way it will be? This was a climate change protest by youth at City Hall in Portland. So what's going on in Maine? Uh, it's gotten warmer and we have more extreme heat days. This is, uh, we have land and ocean temperatures going up, rising sea levels, you can see and read the text. Also public health issues. But I wanna mention, I give you a link here at the bottom. This is from, so over the last year, 
there was a there was a law passed in 2019 that created something called the Climate Council, Climate Change Council, and there were then eight or nine uh, groups, working groups that all of last year met and then uh, put studies and information together, which you can find on on the website, and then the climate. Climate Council, which was about 50 people appointed by the governor and others, met and used that information, came up with a final report in November, I believe, December. And there will be legislation introduced this session in the legislature to try to implement key aspects of the report. So some of the data I'm going to show you come directly out of that report. But they are we have what we're calling ocean heat waves in the Gulf of Maine. So the Gulf of Maine, interestingly, is the second fastest warming body of water in the world. The first is a small gulf off of Japan. So we have a lot of things going on in our Gulf of Maine and, it, and that results in impacts on species. So we're moving away from being a subarctic gulf to something different and something warmer. And we know how important lobsters are to our economy. They used to be a lot of lobstering in Southern New England, and that's pretty much gone because of the warming water, diseases that then come with it, and the lobsters themselves looking for colder water to survive. And that's why lobstering, the lobster harvest in Maine has gone up in recent years, but the concern is that they're also still starting to move slowly northward more toward Canada. One thing that doesn't get talked about a lot with climate change and the ocean or Gulf of Maine is acidity. So you can see that acidity has risen quite a bit. And that's because as greenhouse gases rise in the atmosphere from carbon emissions, when it rains and precipitates, you're having rainwater that has more carbon in it and it goes into the ocean and then it affects the acidity. And so it impacts aquaculture, which we've been trying to develop as an industry here, and certainly marine organisms that have shells and use calcium carbonate to do so. So acidity has become a problem. So when we move from the water to the land, our winters are shorter, our summers are longer. That, that's great for a lot of people, although it certainly hurts our, our ski, snowmobile, ice fishing, and other industries in Maine. Um, but it also has increased our public health risks from Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. And we've been lucky in Maine um, because climate change has also caused a number of pests that devastate forests out in the Rockies, the Colorado Rockies, the Canadian Rockies. We haven't had that explode here yet in Maine, but it's only a matter of time. I wanted to show you this. This was from I can't remember if this was from the climate action report or from a report from the University of Maine that they update every few years. But if you look to the left, my left here, annual temperatures by climate division, you can see how it makes sense. The, the increase in temperatures of 3.4 degrees Fahrenheit has gone up more than, slightly more than inland, but still 3.1 degrees up in Northern Maine, annual increase. It, on average since 1895 is a lot and and it's only going to accelerate and you can see to the right some of the impacts from that we have fewer days of ice with ice and frost and snow need uh, we have more mud uh, which we probably don't want we have but it's it's more days that insect pests can survive and we also have more actual, you know, the rainfall and snowfall has generally increased. Although again, you wouldn't know it from this month because we've had so little snow since our, our last big storm, but you have more extreme precipitation events. In other words, when we do get rain, it, it tends to be more intense, more concentrated and then spread out the events. But that causes increased impacts, adverse impacts to the lakes, which again have been warming, but also can help facilitate uh, algae blooms. But it also has impact on, on stormwater issues because you get more stormwater runoff in the cities. So again, the lakes have been warming, not a surprise. 
And, but you can see that the surface temperature in Maine lakes has gone up over five degrees on average uh, during the, um, certainly during this century. Um, and again, reduced snowpack, et cetera. It affects our, our wildlife, it affects the natural ecosystem, it affects the economy. This is just an ice out map that I like because it shows Sebago, Dan Marscotta Lakes in the south that basically you're getting ice out earlier and earlier, which means shorter ice fishing season, which again is comparable to Greenland. So again, some of the things I'm showing you about Maine are analogous to what's happening over there. And, and it's because we just have fewer days of ice and opportunities of, of cold weather. So where's Maine heading? This is from the one of the reports as well. I mean, nobody knows for sure, but if we do not uh, significantly control and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, essentially what this section is saying, we're looking at a, another a five degree Fahrenheit increase by 2050. That's just 30 years from now. So a lot more high heat index days, which is over 90 degrees, and you get more insects and pathogens spreading, including West Nile virus, which we know is potentially fatal. Um, you're getting more rain, less snow. You're getting um, warmer water. So again, Gulf of Maine gets another 1.5 degrees warmer and you're getting sea level rise. So again, while Greenland may be not experiencing sea level rise, we're getting the impact of Greenland's 40% contribution to global sea level rise as it melts. And what is that gonna do? It's gonna increase flooding events in our cities on the coast. And we have a number of cities and towns and villages along the coast, including York and Portsmouth and others your way. And by 2100, again, you can see, nobody knows for sure, but the projection is it could be one to two meters of sea level rise, which uh, if you think about Maine's coast, while we do have a rocky coast, really from Portland south, we have a lot of sand beaches. So again, we have this intense rainfall, so stormwater, more pollutants going out to sea. Um, but what's interesting also is that this will impact, including on the lakes, property values. And why is that? It's because water clarity gets reduced as the lakes warm, and it's going to impact potentially our, our issues on the coast, again, from sea level rise, similar statistics you've seen before, so I won't spend long on this, but basically, if you think about, think about where houses are located, think about summer cottages, think about where businesses are located near the ocean, and think about, again, York County, Cumberland County, where it's not 10 feet above the water with a rocky coast, but a sand beach or a gentle slope up to where houses and streets are. And if you've got a one to three or four foot sea level rise on average, you can see just a one foot rise is a 15 times increase in nuisance flooding, meaning that you're gonna have damage. And just in the last 10 years in Portland, that's increased four times, in other words, four times as much nuisance flooding on a hundred year average. So that, that means you're gonna have more property damage. You're gonna have more flooding. You're gonna lose more beaches, sand dunes, salt marshes, and you're gonna lose potentially, you can see here in this last paragraph, about 43% of our, our sand, our dry beach area which I know I would be very unhappy about in the summertime. And, um, and that also impacts our tourist industry because our coastal economy in the summer is largely driven by both beach access and, and related access to coastal resources. So, and this, this is just a slide I put together myself on thinking out of the box. So if sea level rises, what, what are the potential legal complications? Because most of the laws we deal with were enacted and planning done before anybody even heard the phrase climate change or thought about sea level rise in a significant way. So where, how does that impact property boundaries? And because we talk about 
the intertidal zone and public access, which has been litigated a lot in York and Cumberland County. And the zone changes as tides get higher, as well as where property lines are. Flood insurance, there was a significant risk. This goes back about, whoa, 10, 15 years ago, where FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, was going to revise Maine's zone, FEMA zone maps so that a number of parts of the coast of Maine were not going to be able to get insured. So that if your house or property or building was damaged, um, you would not have federal insurance for that, flood insurance. Private companies wouldn't insure you for it. That was ultimately beaten back politically, but it would not surprise me as sea level rise continues and you have more of what's called nuisance flooding if we see that come back again. Submerged lands, normally in Maine, you have to get a, a lease from the state if you're going to build a boat dock or anchor something for an extended period of time, build into the seabed, pay a, pay a fee to the Bureau of Public Lands and so just where submerged lands are will change as the tidal zone changes. Um, same thing with probably laws will have to be changed in terms of the sand dune law, coastal wetland law, shoreland zoning. Every town has a shoreland zoning ordinance. And again, increased insurance claims and disputes. Um, acidity, again, we've talked about and that, um, and ultimately, again, it's accelerating faster, but most of the national environmental groups now and in Maine are, are admitting and saying that the greatest threat to wildlife are not from wind turbines, are not from certain uh, energy sources or otherwise, or from buildings, et cetera. It's from climate change. Um, cats, however, are a significant uh, threat to birds when they're outside. But climate change is really the number one overall threat to wildlife. Um, again, quickly, I mentioned Maine in terms of our forests. So while 80% of Iceland is covered by ice, 89% of Maine is covered by forests and sequester a lot of our carbon emissions. And, but as, as if there is damage to the forest from pests and, and there's actually, as, as temperatures warm, the nature of the species in the forest changes as well. Uh, because you start the difference between hardwood and softwood, you start you're going to start seeing more softwood and, and less hardwood. Um, and again, the pests are Maine has some of the highest densities of non-native forest pests in the United States, and that's not a good trend. And so again, this was Audubon Maine Audubon statement about the type of birds those of you into birds birding um, as to what are most at risk, the type of birds we have here from an increase in temperature. And our, our, can't remember, is this chickadee the state bird, I guess, the black cap chickadee, certainly on our license plate, is one of the ones that also is at significant risk. So ultimately, I wanna talk about benefits because again, we talked about opportunities for Maine, opportunities for Greenland. What are the comparisons? So this is from the state climate change report in December. They identify as opportunities, uh, a growing renewable energy industry, land and ocean based wind power, solar and biofuels. So the need for getting off of greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels, Maine used to be again, natural, re natural resource economy, wind and even solar are natural resources as are trees. So could we use those to both reduce greenhouse gas emissions and create jobs? That's what the governor and the uh, legislative initiatives are, are gonna be exploring. Um, again, some benefits from warmer temperatures, you have a longer summer season, you might have more cruise ships, you might have more boating, but it does hurt skiing and snowmobiling. And it also may help farmers because you get a wider range of crops and animals, but again, the erratic precipitation means you've gotta have access to water. Um, and then the fact, again, that uh, Arctic Ocean is melting, it could shorten the distance between East Asia and the North Atlantic by 40%. We have Eastport, Searsport, and Portland as our three major ports, which could be greater engaged other than just IMSKIP. 
And, and you can see, again, this is from a report on, on some of the sectors that might grow from, from these opportunities. But overall, it's still gonna be more negative than positive. So again, this was that map I showed you earlier and why, again, they're talking about opportunities for shipping because of Maine's location in the uh, United States as being the closest and certainly the closest deep water port to Northern Europe and, and the North Atlantic. So as I end here, a couple general takeaways before we have questions. Um, we have a lot in common. We're vacation land. They don't have a big tourist industry. They're trying to market that uh, as, as best they can. We both have significant fishery industries. Theirs is bigger than ours in terms of as a percentage of their economy, but ours is still a significant part of both our economy and our culture. And this issue of jobs versus environment and, and conflict between locals and what, what the state or federal or national government might want. And again, what happens in Greenland and elsewhere has impacts all over the world and particularly from, from Greenland, which takes me to this, these final couple slides, which I like to use, which is, so we all know everybody, we have a majority of people who say climate change exists. We have a majority of people who say it's human cause now in the United States and certainly in Greenland but why does such a small number of people in the US say they're impacted by it? At Socrates to the right there, I just use it because he likes to ask questions with, with starting with why, as do I. And, and this was a quote uh, or a passage from somebody else, but it is an existential threat potentially, and yet it's getting worse and we're not seeming to be able to get it under control in any way sort of like the pandemic. And there are some parallels between COVID and climate change that are being talked about. Very different as well. But part of it is this issue of how we as humans see risk. And part of the challenge is climate change is invisible, largely. You don't see it. You don't feel it immediately. It's not concrete. Um, you're talking about looking at short-term costs and against um, uncertain losses in the future. So that goes to this intergenerational question. Are people willing to sacrifice now so that your children and grandchildren and those of others don't have even greater damage and harm in the future? And we know that not only are there coal, oil, and gas executives who really want to get as much out of the ground as they can now, which would cause more harm. But we have similar debates in the fishing industry right now. There are some fishermen who say, we can't keep going the way we're going in terms of how much we're, our fishing is going on, how much stock we're taking, but also trying to locate offshore wind in the United States, particularly in the Northeast and North Atlantic. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that almost every square inch of the Gulf of Maine, somebody seems to say they fish in. So just even running a cable from a wind power site to shore on the sea bottom draws a lot of concern. And so the other part of climate change that's difficult, as they say here, you know, no pressing deadlines like tomorrow. People aren't being seen as dying from it as they are with COVID. And as they say at the end here, not an external enemy. It's not like there's somebody invading our country directly. But again, it's partly because of the, the issue of the invisible emissions. So there's two books I, I suggest, actually I have a third in a moment, but this is on climate change. The one by George Marshall is, again, addressing this question of how, why can we not seemingly take action on something like climate change when, when a majority of us say it exists, but a, a minority say it harms them. And then to the right is when people ask about, well, what can I do or how do I reduce my carbon footprint? This is a book that page by page takes things that are in your kitchen, in your library, in your living room, in your daily life, in your car, that, that quantifies the carbon footprint. Because bananas, for example, and the reason he puts it on the cover is we don't grow bananas in Maine. Uh, we don't grow bananas in a lot of the U.S., so they are shipped. And so what's the carbon footprint that goes with shipping a banana from South America 
to Maine, for example. Um, and, and this is a book I recommend. I came across it after we got back from Greenland. And it is, it's fascinating because in the early 1900s, Greenland was viewed by explorers as like the moon, the last frontier, the place that people hadn't gone at all. And crossing the ice cap in Greenland was seen as, as like climbing Mount Everest or worse. And it's just, it's amazing the people and what they did and how they try to survive and didn't survive, some of them just crossing from one side to the other. It's a really well-written book, so I, I do recommend it. You can get it from the library or, or elsewhere. So in the end, I have a couple articles I've written in, the, in recent years that unfortunately are still true about trying to, trying to take science, climate change science, and put it in relative, I'll call it non-science terms as to what's going on, what are the impacts, and what can we do about it. So those are two links you'll have. And that's the end of my slideshow. So Sophie, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing and uh, go back to you to facilitate questions. Thank you. That was really informative and so interesting. Um, it, uh, a lot of that was new to me and it's just always, very interesting. So uh, at this point, I welcome anybody who would like to ask questions to either unmute yourself and ask in person. You can certainly um, direct them in the chat and I'm happy to relay them for you. Um, or if you want to raise your hand on Zoom, I can also call on people that way, whatever works for you. If I may, um, during World War II, which I wasn't around for, the government was able to declare an emergency and, you know, mandate certain types of things such as travel, uh, you know, the coupon books, etc. What is it about this, other than the lack of a political will, that prevents something? being done on a national scale so we don't have this hodgepodge of responses. You know, some states take it seriously, some jurisdictions within a state that doesn't take it seriously takes it seriously, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. That's a great question. And I could almost say, well, see, are you talking about climate change or about COVID? Because you could say that about both, right? Yes. And, and uh, so I just mentioned as an aside, I, I fell into a rabbit hole back in March. I started working on COVID law as well, which was not something I envisioned at the beginning of the year. In part, I'll just tell this quick story. Some of you may, it, March seems like a long time ago, but back in the third week of March, the island of North Haven voted to preclude anybody coming on to the island who was not a year round resident. And the governor's office called them and said, you can't do that. And so they ultimately backed down and a, a national reporter contacted the law school said, can somebody tell me whether, you know, what the law is on that or not? And nobody raised their hand until finally I said, okay, I'll, I'll tackle that. And so I had to do some quick research and then that's the rabbit hole I've been in since is what can governments do to respond during a, an emergency? So, and, and with COVID, it's a public health emergency. So there are some laws that delegate authority to take measures to even restrict certain civil rights or liberties like travel or uh, that make you quarantine or potentially wear masks or things like that, that you would not be able to do absent that crisis, that emergency. Climate change has not been defined as a public health emergency or other type of emergency. Now, as you point out political will, um, if, if a law was enacted or created to say that climate change is such an emergency and delegate powers to either the president or at the state level, a, a governor to take certain actions, then they could actually maybe do more but it is the hodgepodge, you're right, has been a hodgepodge on COVID. It is also on, on climate change. And in part, the difficulty with 
that is our, and I don't wanna get off into too much of a lawyerly uh, discussion, but under the, the US Constitution, um, there's a, something called the Commerce Clause, which basically says states cannot restrict interstate commerce. So we, we you know, years ago, Maine thought about banning uh, interstate waste, waste from other states coming in. And, and I was involved in that in terms of landfills and stuff. Now we, we definitely restrict it, but we can't totally ban it because it's viewed, waste is viewed as a commerce, as, as something that has value. Um, but we could theoretically with climate change, the issue would be, what do you do? And ultimately, I think it's gonna have to be in part accelerating clean energy usage because again, long answer, I'm not seeing other hands up at the moment, but we energy is three things. Our energy use is three things. It is for heating, transportation and electricity. And most of our electricity in Maine is renewable, but um, our transportation and heating is largely fossil fuel. So if we could electrify our economy, when we had Maine Yankee, those of you who remember the nuclear power plant, that was roughly 800 megawatts of electricity. And when I first moved to Maine, in 1979, I had electric baseboard heat in my apartment. A lot of us had electric heat then, which then I don't now, many don't, but if you could, we have electric heat pumps now and people are, are using heat pumps more because electricity is cleaner than having an oil furnace run all the time. So the more we could generate uh, non-fossil fuel electricity for cars, for heating, as well as for lights, then at least we and hopefully other states could and would um, reduce fossil fuel emissions. And, and the last scary thing I'll say, or not scary, is, um, I see a question in the chat I'll get to in a minute. We in Maine export, so we send out of state every year about five to six billion dollars. That's roughly four thousand dollars for every person on this call and for each member of your family, no matter how old they are, in in buying fossil fuels from elsewhere. Gasoline, oil, um, largely is what those are. And the more we could reduce that, the more you keep, if you could keep two or $3 billion in our economy, we don't have any industry moving here that, that's creating those opportunities. So it's just something to think about. So sorry for that long answer, but it's complicated and it, it really is an important policy issue, as you say, both nationally and otherwise. Um, I had a question to me in the chat looking for more information about the natural forests in Greenland. If you could speak to that a little. Yeah, there aren't a lot of natural forests in Greenland, as I said, because of so much ice there. The, when you are, and, and maybe Vinton Valentine, who's on, will remember too, he has a better sense, is a geographer, but we didn't really see a lot of forests there. And, and so partly with the ice melting, there's a, th a, th a thinking that, you know, there may be more opportunity for some trees to grow, but, uh, but a lot of the trees have either been harvested or not, are just not, not able to grow. Um, so certainly forestry is not much of an issue there. Um, one of the questions in the chat, um, well, recommends Susan recommends the story of more by Hope Jaron. How we got to climate, how we got to climate change, and where to go from here. Highly recommended. So I'll mention that. I have I'm not familiar with that, but thank you. And then there's a question here from Jane. The Gulf of Maine wind farm project is going to take 10 years to fruition. <laughs> Why 10 years? We need it now. I wish I could tell you the answer. Well, I could tell you the answer to that, but I've been working on it for 12 years. It's like four times as long as I expected when I started on it. it. It's partly, and it goes a little bit to the earlier question, switches in politics, um, whose governor makes a difference, who's on the Public Utilities Commission makes a difference, who's president at a given time makes a difference in terms of what their policies are. And ultimately, honestly, it is the issue of public involvement because I've been involved in a lot of projects, one on either side over the years in Maine. 
it it is often easier to get opponents out to hearings than it is to get supporters because opponents get emotional they get whipped up they get organized they show up they make a lot of noise and they will honestly scare um you know planning boards zoning boards even state boards because noise people are noisy and noise sometimes influences people more than than evidence does and so supporting things can be critical to getting projects like the wind farm in the gulf of maine or others done like that the other thing i would mention and i mentioned this the other night at another talk for the falmouth and yarmouth libraries everybody on this zoom call tonight who cares about these issues you've got a, a state representative you've got a state senator in maine they don't get a lot of input on bills that come before them and even five or six people emailing or leaving phone messages for your elected officials saying, I want you to support these bills or these issues and they're important to me and I wanna hear what your position is and hold them accountable when it comes time for reelection, that makes a difference. And, and that's one of the, the great things about Maine. Um, Vinton says in the chat that I was right, that's good. Uh, Except for long-term experimental forests near where we were, Narcissus, woody species are limited mostly to low shrubs, but those shrubs are increasing in cover and height. Um, and then from Carol, native people, impact, influence, and rights, compare Maine and Greenland. That's a good question. So as I said, the majority of people in Greenland are native. That's not the case in Maine and by, by far. And so, to some degree, the native people in Greenland have some more influence, should have some more influence. But again, as I said about that mining operation, they also want, they're trying to, they're trying to survive. They're trying to figure out how to not have to leave Greenland and how to have their youth not leave Greenland. And there just aren't a lot of new jobs coming into Greenland, just as we've started seeing in Maine and that concern as well. And so for them, uh, my sense is that it, the, it, it is a difficult problem for them in terms of impacts on their culture and their traditional way of life with the limited economic opportunities to otherwise um, put food on the table, but also to have employment and to um, keep their youth there. Whereas in Maine, as, as everybody knows on this call, we have a, a small, relatively small number of Native Americans, um, four or five tribes, designated tribes, a couple reservations, and um, particularly the Passamaquoddy and the Penobscot. And so, and we have the Indian land claims settlement with the state. So the ability of the Native Americans in Maine to actually influence policy at the state level has been very limited. And, and certainly, I mean, there's been litigation over water rights and access on the Penobscot River that the tribes have generally lost. Um, they have a representative in the state legislature, one um, that's designated. I will say that under federal law that uh, and, and in Maine as well, the, the tribes are viewed as municipalities, municipal entities, and at the federal level, they're viewed as a sovereignty so that they have to be consulted in the same way that governmental entities are consulted. But having said that, it, it certainly, and in, in the U.S. generally, the influence of Native people is, is much less, part, largely because of population and, and generally, um, you know, under development and economic uh, insufficiency as well. Um, see, Sophie, I'm not seeing others in the chat. I haven't received any other questions. Um, if anyone has one, this is your chance. Um, if not, I will be uh, sharing the video recording of this presentation as well as the slides um, and probably I'll you know, put together a little bibliography to any of the resources we have in the library all together on our virtual archive. 
um, tomorrow afternoon sometime. So please check back at yorkpubliclibrary.org if you'd like to follow up on any of this information. And uh, Jeff, thank you so much for <laughs> coming and giving us this talk. It's really been enlightening and uh, I hope um, more people will take note of a lot of the issues discussed tonight. So thank you. Yeah, feel free. You all will have my email address in the slides. And so feel free if you have, want any follow up to drop me an email. And like I, I said to Sophie beforehand, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not uh, uh -huh. flying and getting on any planes or, or boats or anything else. So I'm happy to respond to people and to uh, continue the dialogue. So th thank you all very much for attending. I really appreciate it.